When it comes to cameras, there are so many options. And if you're as confused as I once was by the sheer number of cameras that just Sony sells, well then this one's for you. Let's start with the brand new, highly anticipated Sony Alpha 7 Mark IV that starts shipping at the end of this year. This is the fourth iteration of Sony's full-frame entry-level hybrid camera. As a hybrid camera, the a7 IV is meant to be the jack of all trades but master of none. In other words, it's excellent for both photos and videos. While the predecessor to this camera started at just $2,000, the a7 IV will set you back $2,500 and of course that's without any lenses. The a7 IV steps it up with a brand new, higher resolution 33 megapixel sensor and can shoot oversampled 4K video with 10-bit 422 color at up to 60 frames per second. This camera shares the same processor and autofocus system as the top of the line Alpha 1 and even has some new tricks up its sleeve such as animal eye autofocus in video mode. However, this is still the entry level model. Stills are limited to 10 shots per second, rolling shutter is prominent when shooting 4K video, and that highly desirable 4K60, that's shot in Super 35 mode, which is essentially equal to the field of view of what a APS-C camera has, which we'll discuss a little bit later. Next up, we have a reimagined version of the A7 Mark IV's predecessor because that was a very successful and very popular camera. Essentially, Sony took the a7 III and managed to pack it into a compact APS-C body to make one of the smallest full-frame cameras on the market. At $1,800, not only did it get a price drop, Sony modernized it with new features like gyro stabilization for more stable handheld video and a new flip-out screen. The compact nature of the a7C makes it attractive for enthusiasts who want to enjoy the benefits of a full-frame sensor without the burden of carrying a bulky camera. Sony even accompanied the release of the a7C with three new very compact prime lenses. This camera marks a new direction for Sony, leaving many people wondering what they have in store for their current line of compact cameras, the APS-C lineup, which we'll talk about later. Next up, we have the a7S Mark III which prioritizes video while sacrificing high resolution photography. The S in A7S stands for sensitivity because the pixels in this sensor are extremely sensitive and able to deliver exceptional low light performance, which is essential for video because you don't have the same kind of shutter flexibility as you do with photography. The sensor in this camera is only 12 megapixels, which may come as a surprise to many because that's the same number of pixels found in an iPhone. At first, that sounds silly for a professional camera, but in reality, 4K video only uses about 8.3 megapixels. Using less pixels over a large sensor means that pixels can be bigger and capture more light, and it also means that there's less pixels to scan for even faster readouts. This is why the a7S III can shoot 4K video at up to 120 frames per second as well as 4K video in 16-bit RAW, giving you the most control over your video's colors in post-production. These are some incredible specs for a mirrorless camera, making it a popular choice for serious video content creators. Next up, we have the a7R Mark IV, and it's the complete opposite of the a7S III. This is the fourth iteration of Sony's high-resolution cameras, hence the R. This camera comes with a whopping 61 megapixel sensor, and to this date, it is still the highest resolution full-frame camera you can buy. In fact, there are so many pixels that each individual uncompressed RAW photo is a massive 120 megabytes in file size. That's equal to nearly a minute of video from your iPhone. Speaking of video, the a7R4 can shoot great 4K video at up to 30 frames per second, but the drawbacks of having so many pixels is that 61 million pixels is way more than the 8.3 million you need for 4K video. In the case of the a7 IV, the camera scans the entire 33 megapixel sensor and then downsamples what is a 7K image to 4K. The a7R4 just isn't capable of scanning the entire 61 megapixel sensor fast enough, so a tactic called pixel binning is used, which in short is inferior to oversampling. However, high quality oversampled video is possible with the a7R4, but only in Super 35 mode, which is a 50% crop, but it's still the better way to go for video with this camera. 
This camera was really designed for professional photographers looking to capture as much detail as possible, which is useful for things like large prints or cropping your images in post. One thing to mention though is that even though this is the fourth iteration of the A7R series, this camera is already two years old. But the average lifespan of an R series camera is just a little over two years, so who knows what's on the horizon. Next up, we have the $4,500 A9 Mark II, and this camera was designed to help a photographer seemingly stop time and capture high-speed action on a dime. It has a high-speed 24 megapixel stacked sensor, allowing it to capture up to 20 shots per second with 60 autofocus and auto exposure calculations per second. All of that makes this the perfect solution for shooting high-speed action, especially professional sports photographers, including those that shoot at big events like the Olympics, because this camera contains high-speed connections like an ethernet cable to quickly move photographs to an editing station. This camera was really not made for your average photographer photographer and it wasn't really even made for video because it doesn't have any picture profiles like S-Log. Like the A7R 4 the A9 Mark II is a two-year-old camera and just when these serious action photographers were craving for a Mark III, Sony decided to release something else. Earlier, I referred to the A7 Mark IV as the jack of all trades, master of none, and every other camera I talked about had some kind of specialty, such as low light performance, high resolution photos, or insane speeds. To master one category, these cameras had to sacrifice something. That's just the way it's always been. That is, until Sony announced the Alpha One. With a name like that, and with a price tag of $6,500, Sony wanted to offer a camera that could truly master everything. The A1 has a ultra high resolution 50 megapixel sensor, and it's stacked like the A9 II, but it's much faster. It can shoot 30 shots per second with faster autofocus speeds than ever before, and unlike the video-centric A7 III, it can shoot in 8K. Thanks to incredibly fast sensor readout speeds, the A1 marks a new direction for next generation cameras that can do things with a vibration free electronic shutter that were previously not possible. In fact, Nikon's new Z9 flagship is a very similar camera, but they decided to remove the mechanical shutter altogether. Now, we leave the full frame sensor for a sensor roughly one third the size, also known as APS-C. These sensors shouldn't be underestimated though as they're still about 10 times bigger than the sensor in a smartphone. Unlike other brands, Sony's APS-C cameras share the same lens amount as their full frame lineup so lenses are interchangeable between the two systems. Having a smaller sensor though does mean that your field of view will be cropped in when using the same lens or focal length. So, first for APS-C, we have the top of the line Alpha 6600, which starts at $1,400 for the body. That's only $400 cheaper than the A7C, which is technically a full frame camera with an APS-C body. Like the A7C, the A6600 has a 24 megapixel sensor and similar autofocus speeds, which includes animal and human eye tracking. It can shoot up to 11 shots per second and is the only APS-C camera to have in-body image stabilization. When it comes to video, the A6600 can shoot very sharp oversampled 4K video at up to 30 frames per second and full HD video at up to 120 frames per second. The A6600 also contains picture profiles like S-Log3 and HLG, allowing for exceptional dynamic range and color grading to make those cinematic videos. However, where this camera falls short is that the sensor inside is actually quite old and suffers from severe rolling shutter for 4K video. In fact, the APS-C cameras share the same exact sensor, which as far as I can tell made its debut over 5 years ago with the A6300. Next up, we have the A6400, which is actually the successor to the A6300. In short, it is essentially an A6600 with a smaller battery, without in-body image stabilization, and without eye tracking autofocus for video. Those missing features though will save you about $500 as the A6400 is only $900. This is outstanding value and which is why this camera was a tremendous success for the APS-C line. 
Below the A6400 is the A6100, which is Sony's entry-level APS-C camera that starts at about 750 bucks. This camera is the direct successor to the most successful mirrorless camera of all time, the A6000. The A6100 is kind of identical to the A6400 though, except that it's made from plastic and has some software limitations. Unfortunately, although it can shoot incredibly sharp 4K video, some of those software limitations include a lack of picture profiles like S-Log, which means that it doesn't have very good dynamic range for video. However, when it comes to entry-level photography, there's really not many cameras that can beat the A6100. Lastly, for APS-C, we have a new camera aimed at casual content video creators. Coming in at a very impressive $700, it's the most affordable Sony APS-C camera you can buy, but it's nearly as capable, if not more capable, than the high-end A6600. It's essentially an A6400 with some modern upgrades like an improved flippy screen and gyro-based stabilization that not only helps stabilize footage, but also helps with that severe rolling shutter these APS-C cameras suffer from. The ZV-E10 is designed for beginners that want to utilize the benefits of interchangeable lenses, and Sony made this camera as easy as possible with features like background defocus, which can, at the push of a button, instantly adjust aperture, shutter speed, and ISO to change your depth of field. It also comes with a decent quality, usable microphone, and since this camera is meant for video, it doesn't actually have a viewfinder. Next up, we're going to step it down a notch to the 1 inch sensor, which isn't actually 1 inch in size. In fact, this sensor is one third the size of APS C. The RX100 Mark 7 is a pocket sized point and shoot camera that comes with a 20.1 megapixel stack sensor and a single fixed lens with a zoom range of 24mm all the way up to 200mm. It can shoot 4K video at up to 30 frames per second with picture profiles like S-Log and thanks to the speed of that stack sensor, it can shoot up to 20 images per second and slow motion video at a staggering 960 frames per second. The convenience and versatility though of this camera is going to set you back $1300. Lastly, for the one in sensor and for this video is the ZV-1, Sony's vlogger-centric camera that made waves when it launched in 2020. It is essentially a reimagined RX100 Mark 7 at almost half the price, but it's designed for video content creators that need something in their pockets. The ZV-1 has a wider aperture lens to capture more light than the RX100, but can only zoom up to 70 millimeters. The ZV-E10 mentioned earlier is essentially an APS-C version of the ZV-1, which is the first camera to introduce features like background defocus, product showcase mode, and a usable onboard microphone. I believe this was also Sony's first camera to utilize this style of flip-out screen, which has made its way into pretty much most new Sony cameras. Well, that about concludes pretty much every Sony camera that I think is relevant, with of course exceptions because there are a lot of cameras that Sony makes, including the Cinema line, which is probably something someone like me shouldn't be trying to explain. And with that, thank you guys very much for watching.